Amazon Prime Video moved one of their monitoring services from microservices to a monolith. I'm using air quotes here because I really think they did themselves a disservice by using that term. I'm Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com, and there's been a lot of what I think bad takes focusing on the wrong things, focusing on this microservices to monolith, serverless, etc. when really all this was about was refactoring and evolving their architecture. Let me explain. This video is brought to you by EventStoreDB, the stream database built from the ground up for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. I'll have a link in the description to the original blog post, but to summarize what their original architecture was, and I want to point some things out here, is that they have this audio video stream that's going to a media conversion service. And that's basically extracting frames from that stream and then putting those to Amazon S3. Then we have this workflow from AWS, Lambdas, and Step Functions that then have to pull that data from S3 so it can analyze them for things like if the video is corrupt or it's um, frozen, et cetera. Then all that data is then aggregated and pushed out back to S3. But a key thing to note here is that we kind of have a bunch of stuff distributed. We have this media conversion service that does what it needs to do, converts those frames, put them S3. Then we have individual step functions that need to execute and pull that data from S3 as well. So we have a lot more things distributed here in executing independently. So this worked until it didn't. And I think that's where people have some of these takes of, oh, well, it's serverless. So this should just scale infinitely forever. Well, that's not really the case because I want to highlight here is that a part of the post, they said, they never intended nor designed it to run at a high scale. And when they did, they ran into issues of cost in scaling. Because it's distributed and we have step functions executing independently, distributed, that means it makes sense here that we have this S3 bucket where each one can actually go get that data. And that's gonna incur cost because each individual detector, which is its own step function, has to get that data from S3. And here's what they moved to, which to me seems logical, is that instead of using Lambda, instead of using serverless in S3, now we have everything hosted within an Amazon ECS task, a container. That means that when we have our audio video stream, it's going to our container and our media converter is in our container. It can extract those frames. And then instead of having to push them to S3, because we got our detectors held within process inside that container, we have the frames in memory. We can just pass them along in memory. Then after we get aggregate our results, again, within the same process in memory, then we can output that to S3. There's no media conversion separate from the detectors. All that orchestration is done within a single container within ECS. That means that we don't have this need to extract, put it to S3 and fetch from S3. We're all in memory because we're within the same process or the same ECS task. So I think there's been a lot of bad takes on this. And I'm not really sure if people just do this for views for their content or if they actually even read the post. But things such as serverless was a big mistake, says Amazon. Serverless sucks. Amazon Prime Video team throws AWS serverless under a bus. And even Amazon can't make sense of serverless or microservices. This has nothing to do with serverless, microservices. I'm not even sure what people are talking about here. This was really about the specific use case how they intended to use it, that change, they had to evolve. They realized that distributing it over S3 in this particular context, this use case, at the volume that they needed to, wasn't really applicable. It didn't really, it was gonna cost too much. So they moved it all within an ECS task, a container, so that they could have those frames in memory. So Amazon stated that they moved this from microservices to a monolith. And that I said that that really did them a disservice because it did, because they went from a service to a service. What's a service? Well, a service is the authority of a set of business capabilities. That didn't change. They changed their physical deployment aspect, not nothing to do with the actual functionality of what that service provided. They have these detectors, the detection of the frames, the streams, the inbound streams to notify the customer, the viewer of degraded performance of their stream, et cetera. That's what the capability is. That did not change. Physical boundaries are not logical boundaries. You're defining a logical boundary is what the capabilities are. They changed their physical boundaries. They didn't change the logical boundaries. 
Their service originally is still the same service now. How they implemented it, and per the post, they said they were able, as I could imagine, to reuse a lot of the code. It's just it wasn't executing more distributed. Now they had it in a single process in a single container. If you look at their original diagram here, what's the service? Well, it's not the media conversion service. It's not the AWS Lambda entry point. It's not the step functions. It's not the aggregation. The service is everything. It's this, this is the service. You're defining logical boundaries. That's how you're defining a service. It has nothing to do with how you're actually deploying it. If you're using serverless or lambdas, that doesn't all of a sudden make it microservices. And just because you then convert that and combine everything into one physical deployable unit in ECS task, doesn't all of a sudden turn that into a monolith. You still have a service. So if we have some typological boundary that we have some sort of source code for, for that can turn into, let's say we had some a, a container that was our HTTP API. We could be using that exact same source code identically. That's another container that maybe instead of being HTTP API is interacting with some type of queue-based broker and processing work that way. And we could be scaling out these containers, both of them, the, the HTTP API and the worker. Physical boundaries are not logical boundaries. When we're talking about a service, we're talking about a logical boundary. So what did Amazon Prime Video really do? They refactored their service. That's it. They evolved their architecture. They realized that at the scale they needed, their existing initial solution using Lambda, Step Function, and S3 wasn't viable. They evolved. They turned into an ECS task, so they didn't have to move that data back in, in and out of S3, but had it in process. That's all they did was refactor. So this isn't an indictment on serverless or that serverless sucks or that microservices are terrible and we should be using monoliths. Context matters, context is king. Their original solution worked until it didn't based on scale. Then they evolved their architecture, moved everything in process, that's it, it was a refactor. Context is king. That's not to say that serverless is terrible everywhere. It was at the scale that they needed for their solution, their specific context. That's it. Ironically, I created a video about logical boundaries not being physical boundaries even before I read this post. I'll have a link to it at the very end of this video. I highly recommend watching it because it does clear the confusion and hopefully it can get us past this point of these weird takes about microservices, serverless, monoliths, etc. If you don't conflate or confuse logical boundaries and physical boundaries, it opens up a lot of possibilities. If you found topics like this interesting, you have some other thoughts or questions or your own opinions, you can chat with other software developers, get access to my private Discord server to do so, check the links in the description on how to join. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.